Michelle Hadley was born in 1985 in Ontario, California, a city located 40 miles east of Los Angeles. Her parents, who owned a small manufacturing business in town, never had a ton of money, but they always had enough to make ends meet. Growing up, Michelle's parents taught her and her younger sister to always put their all into whatever it was they were involved in, whether it was academics, athletics, or relationships. They also taught their daughters to always take their Christianity very seriously. By the time Michelle was in high school, she had made her parents very proud, becoming one of the top students in her class, and also becoming a very talented cross-country runner. But despite these early successes, Michelle never bragged about them. Not because she was trying to stay humble, necessarily, but because that was just her personality. She was a very private person who did not seek the spotlight. After high school, Michelle attended Dickinson College in Pennsylvania on a scholarship, and then after graduation, when Michelle was just 22 years old, she married her high school sweetheart. However, that relationship would not last. When they divorced just four years later, Michelle was upset about it, but she was confident that she was going to be okay. She was still very young, she had the full support of her family, and she had a good job that allowed her to be self-sufficient. All she needed to do was to be patient and wait for the right partner to come along. And in 2013, roughly a year after her divorce, it seemed like the right partner had. In August of that year, Michelle connected with a U.S. Marshal named Ian Diaz on a dating website. The U.S. Marshal Service is the federal government's primary agency for fugitive investigations. Shortly after Michelle and Ian connected online, they met in person for the first time over a cup of coffee. At 35, Ian was nine years older than Michelle. He was tall and fit. Michelle was slender with dark hair and deep brown eyes. They both had great smiles, and right away, they hit it off. That first cup of coffee was quickly followed by text messages, phone calls, and arrangements to meet again. On just their second date, Ian blurted out, I love you, to Michelle. This definitely caught Michelle by surprise, but she was thrilled. As a child, she sometimes fantasized about being a princess and having her Prince Charming come along and whisk her away. And suddenly, it seemed like that actually was happening. Over the next several months, the pair would continue to see each other on a near daily basis. And then in the spring of 2014, they moved in together. And then in December of 2014, Ian took Michelle on a trip to New York City where he asked for her hand in marriage. And she would say, yes, Michelle was on cloud nine. Ian really was her Prince Charming. Once they were engaged, Michelle threw herself into planning their perfect future together as Mr. and Mrs. Diaz. However, cracks began to appear in their relationship. Michelle would later say that Ian had pressured her to take a $20,000 pay cut to leave her job that she loved and take a marketing position at a place he loved and had once worked himself, Disneyland Resort in Anaheim, California. She also said that Ian began asking her to wear more revealing, sexier clothes, and he wanted her to get acrylic nails and get her belly button pierced. It wasn't Michelle's style, but since she didn't want to disappoint her future husband, she would, from time to time, put on the crop tops and short skirts just to make him happy. But despite doing that, Ian never really did seem happy, and eventually he would open up to her about some of his deeper sexual fantasies. He told Michelle that what he really wanted to see was her having sex with other men. At first, Michelle was stunned and said, no, absolutely not. But despite her refusal, Ian brought the subject up again and again, each time with a little more insistence. And then finally, Michelle agreed. On Valentine's Day 2015, with enough cold medicine and alcohol in her system to lower her inhibitions, Michelle had sex with a stranger that she believed Ian had recruited on Craigslist. What Michelle didn't know was that Ian had filmed the entire sexual encounter, and then afterward, he wanted to watch it with her. Michelle was horrified. She begged Ian to destroy this video, but Ian refused and said, no one forced you to do it. But despite these huge issues in their relationship, they did not cause the couple to end their engagement. In fact, these issues only seemed to bring the couple closer together, if for the wrong reasons. As Ian became more and more controlling of Michelle, Michelle became more and more emotionally dependent on Ian. And so with that in mind, in June of 2015, eight months before their wedding date, Ian and Michelle took out a mortgage together and they moved into a brand new two-story condo in downtown Anaheim, California. It was Michelle who came up with the entire $14,400 down payment, but she didn't care. She and Ian were both so excited about a change of scenery to hopefully get their relationship back on track. Just weeks after moving in, all of the excitement of the new place was gone, and in its place were all of their old, unresolved issues. Soon, minor disagreements became major arguments, 
and major arguments turned into vicious accusations of infidelity and betrayal. Finally, the fights turned physical. When Michelle threatened to leave, he held her down on the bed while she tried to kick and claw her way free. Families on both sides of the warring couple had the same advice. You are not good for each other. You need to end it. So at the end of August, just two months after Ian and Michelle had purchased the condo together, Ian took back the engagement ring he had given Michelle, and Michelle packed up her Volkswagen Jetta and drove off to stay with her parents. But as much as Michelle and Ian now wanted out of their relationship, as long as they owned that condo together, they could not entirely sever ties. Michelle wanted Ian to sell the condo so she could get reimbursed for the down payment she had made, but Ian liked the condo and had no intention of moving out. This put them at a sort of standstill and kind of forced them to continue interacting despite being broken up. And surprisingly, through their somewhat regular exchanges over this property, they learned how to be cordial again. Ian would text Michelle first about the property, and then he would follow up and ask how she was doing, and Michelle would do the same thing to Ian. Even though this did not get them anywhere closer to solving their condo issue, it seemed like they were at least at a point where they could treat each other with respect. However, this would not last. On September 10th, so one month after Michelle had moved out and when the condo issue was still completely unresolved, Ian received a very strange and upsetting message from Michelle. In between friendly, cordial text messages, Michelle sent him a long, bizarre, rambly email that could only be described as biblical in her condemnation of the man she once wanted to marry. She wrote, your sins are many, including defiling me and my family with your wicked and evil sexual acts, your financial coercion and irresponsibility, your gluttony, your greed, your lust, your sloth, your wrath, your envy, and most of all, your pride. She finished it with, you may try to hide behind the law of man, but it is a weak shield that will bend and crack against the sword of God. I will bring the full force of the law and the word of God against you to judge you. Ian knew that Michelle and her family were religious, and he knew from their relationship that Michelle was prone to emotional outbursts. But even by her standards, this email revealed a vengefulness that he had not seen before. Ian was so shaken up by it that the very next day, on September 11th, Ian filed a restraining order against Michelle. After reading the email and speaking with Ian, the judge did not grant the restraining order against Michelle. However, Ian's request had now brought Michelle to the notice of the Anaheim police. Shocked that she had even been the subject for a restraining order, Michelle immediately hired an attorney to handle all interactions with Ian, and Ian would hire an attorney as well. And by November of 2015, the lawyers were finally able to work out a compromise with the condo that would allow Michelle and Ian to finally move on from each other. The deal stated that Michelle would not get back her $14,400 down payment. Instead, she would continue to pay half the mortgage for six months. But after that, Ian would either assume full responsibility for the mortgage or he would have to agree to sell the condo and split the profits with Michelle. Even though neither side was fully happy with this arrangement, they both were just exhausted from all the fighting and were ready to just accept it and move on. And so they both signed the agreement and then the six month timer began. Ian stayed in the condo and Michelle, who was living with her parents, decided to get her own small apartment and go back to school to get her master's in business. In January 2016, just a month or so after the condo settlement was finalized, Ian Diaz met another young woman through a dating site. Her name was Angela Connell, she was roughly the same age as Michelle, and she was looking for a serious relationship. When she and Ian finally met in person, they both liked what they saw. During their first date, Ian was honest with Angela and told her that he had just recently gotten out of an engagement that had ended very badly, but he was still certain he wanted to get married and raise a family, which was very reassuring to Angela. Only one month later, Ian and Angela would get married, and Angela would move into Ian's condo, the same condo he had bought with Michelle. In May, just four months after meeting Ian and two months away from the deadline for Ian to assume paying the full mortgage on the condo or sell the property, Angela surprised her husband with a sonogram and announced that she was pregnant with twins. The couple was beyond excited. They sent copies of the sonogram of the twins to family and friends, and Angela wasted no time prepping their home for the twins' arrival. Everything had moved quickly, but the couple was very excited at the prospect of starting a family together. 
Later that month, on May 22nd, Angela was at the condo alone when she hopped on her computer to check her email. Once her inbox loaded, she noticed there was an email from a man named Jason Ray. She didn't recognize the name, but at first glance, it looked like a real email from a real person, not some spam message. So she clicked on it to see what it was. And the words she read sent a chill through her body. The email was definitely not spam. It was a personal message intended for Angela. And whoever this Jason person was clearly knew personal details about her and her husband. The email, which was littered with biblical references, explained to Angela that Ian had been unfaithful to her and that he didn't love her and he never would. Jason also told her that Ian was going to harm her if she didn't leave him immediately. And the email closed by telling Angela that she and her husband had sinned against God. Angela stared at her computer screen for quite a while, wondering what she should do. Eventually, after reading it a few more times, she decided it had to be some sort of sick joke and that the best thing to do was just to ignore it. So she deleted the email, shut her computer, and she walked away. The next morning, Angela logged back onto her computer, and when she opened her email, there was a new email from Jason Ray sitting at the top of her inbox. Angela thought about not even opening it and just deleting it, but her curiosity got the better of her and she clicked it open. Once again, the message was aimed at trying to convince Angela to leave Ian. It was full of biblical references, and at certain points it didn't even make any sense. But there was a new twist to this email versus the one she had received the day before. In this email, the sender, Jason, clearly references Michelle, Ian's ex. Jason would write that Angela was Ian's Eve, and Michelle was Ian's Lilith. According to a particular interpretation of Jewish folklore, Lilith was the first wife of Adam from the famous Adam and Eve story. But Lilith was banished from the Garden of Eden for disobeying Adam, at which point God made Eve out of Adam's rib and then Eve became Adam's wife. While somewhat confusing, the message Jason was sending Angela was fairly clear. Angela was not meant to be Ian's wife. Ian's true wife was Michelle. Angela didn't know anything about Ian's ex, Michelle. All she really knew was her name and that she existed. But despite the lack of insight into who Michelle was, Angela couldn't help but think, this email sounds an awful lot like something a deeply scorned lover would send. And so that night when Ian got home, Angela showed him the latest email from Jason Ray and told him, I think this is your ex, Michelle. At first, Ian was confused. He and Michelle had settled their issues. They had moved on. So why would she write this? But after reading the email a few more times and seeing all the over-the-top biblical language that Michelle had previously used in emails to him, he became convinced as well that this probably was Michelle. However, he told Angela that Michelle was very mercurial and that she must have just gotten worked up about something and she's overreacted, that's why she sent these emails, and she's likely to calm back down and they will never hear from her again. However, he told Angela, if the emails do continue, please let him know and he would go to the police. For the next several days, Angela checked her email, but no strange emails came through. But roughly a week after that first Jason Ray email arrived, Angela received another email from Jason Ray. And this time, the subject line simply said, Die. The body of the message read, I hope you are scared of death tomorrow. Be prepared. Don't sleep. Be watchful of the daughters of God. We will steal your child and we will watch as it dies. Within minutes of receiving this email, Angela received a barrage of others from Jason Ray, as well as from other account names she didn't recognize, like Lilith Truth. And all of these messages included the threat that Angela was going to be harmed in the coming days and there was nothing she could do to stop it. Angela was horrified and was starting to wonder if this really was something Michelle could be doing. It just felt so evil. Then she noticed at the bottom of one of the emails she had just received that it literally said, from Michelle. It looked like the signature had been automatically entered into the email template, and then Michelle must have just forgotten to delete it before sending. Or, as Angela and Ian stared at it and discussed what it could mean, they thought, well, maybe she left it in on purpose. Maybe she wants us to know this is from her. 
Either way, at that point, Ian and Angela felt fairly certain that Michelle was really behind this, and so they printed out all of the nasty emails Angela had received to date, and they took that along with the email Michelle had sent Ian the year before that was very biblical in nature, and they took all of that to the courthouse, and Ian would file another restraining order against Michelle. A few days later, on June 6th, Two police officers went to Michelle's residence and literally handed her the order to appear in court for this restraining order. The date was set for June 17th. But that night, and over the course of the next several days leading up to this court appearance, Angela continued to receive dozens of emails from Jason Ray and Lilith Truth and other anonymous accounts threatening to make her pay for having filed this restraining order. Even though Ian told Angela that there was just no way Michelle was actually going to hurt her, Angela couldn't help but feel terrified and was afraid to leave the house. Finally, June 17th arrived, and Angela and Ian arrived at the court alongside a huge group of friends and family members who were there to support them. When Michelle walked in with her lawyer, she was met with boos and hisses from all of these supporters, and then once court was called to session, Angela and Ian outlined what had been happening over the last couple of weeks, and they showed the judge the stack of all these emails. The judge reviewed the documents and then turned to Michelle and asked her what she had to say for herself. And she would say, I didn't send those emails. I don't know what's going on. I didn't do this. But the judge wasn't buying it, especially given the fact that Ian had previously filed for a restraining order against Michelle for threatening emails. And so this time, the judge did grant the restraining order, prohibiting Michelle from having any further contact with Ian or Angela. Angela and Ian were thrilled, and when they walked out of the courtroom, they felt confident that this nightmare was finally behind them. But within hours of getting home, Angela started receiving more emails, and immediately they contacted the Anaheim police to report that Michelle was already violating her restraining order, but since the emails they were receiving now were not signed by Michelle, there was no way for the police to prove that Michelle was in fact violating her restraining order. And so for several days, the ferocious, threatening, biblical emails continued, and there was seemingly nothing Ian or Angela could do to stop it. Then, as if it wasn't stressful enough, Angela received an email from an account she had not seen before inquiring about her rape fantasy request on Craigslist. Angela did not understand what this person was talking about, but eventually, when she went online and investigated, she discovered there was an entire marketplace of people posting ads on Craigslist seeking partners to take part in a rape fantasy. And someone had clearly been pretending to be Angela and was going into these places on Craigslist and responding to all of these ads saying that she, Angela, was interested. And then she would leave them her address and what she looked like and what her daily habits were like. And according to some of these men that were reaching out now to Angela, apparently whoever was doing this was indicating that Angela didn't just want to be a part of some basic rape fantasy. She wanted to be attacked out in public, and she was encouraging these men to follow her and stalk her, and then attack her and rape her, and even if she tried to say stop, don't. Angela knew Michelle had to be behind this, but again, there was just no evidence tying these rape fantasy responses to Michelle because she wasn't signing her name to them. And so despite how absolutely horrifying it was to learn this was going on, there was nothing the police could do to stop it. For Angela, this was a nightmare. The stress and the fear of this situation was just so much that she basically just hid in her condo all day long. But on June 24th, so one week after the court appearance and just a couple of days after first learning about this rape fantasy ad, Angela had to leave the condo to go out and run a few errands. And so she gathered up her things and she called Ian, who was at work, to let him know that she was heading out in case anything happened to her. And then she left her condo. She went downstairs to the large parking garage underneath their development where residents could park their cars. She hopped in her car and she drove up the ramp out onto the street and then went about her day, running her different errands, and it was totally uneventful. At some point when she was done, she made her way back to the condo complex. She went down the ramp into the underground parking garage. She found her way back to her assigned parking spot. She parked, she got out of her vehicle, she shut the door, and she began walking from her car to the door on the far side of the garage that would lead to the stairwell back up to her actual condo. 
But when she got maybe 30 feet away from this door, she heard movement coming from behind her. She turned around and she saw there was this man who she didn't recognize who was walking very quickly toward her, and because she was already completely on edge, given all these threats she's been receiving, threats of bodily harm, threats of rape, she immediately screamed and started running towards this door that would take her to the stairwell. But before she could open the door and get inside, this man had lunged and grabbed her around the neck, and he was trying to pull her to the ground, and he was trying to pull her clothes off, and Angela began punching and kicking and screaming and biting, doing anything she could, and eventually she was able to fight this person off of her, and he quickly turned and ran away. And then Angela quickly picked up her stuff, she ran into the door, ran upstairs, got into her condo, and as soon as her door had shut and locked behind her, she picked up her phone and she dialed 911. And she was so hysterical that when she talked to the dispatcher, they couldn't understand what was happening, but eventually she was able to tell them what had happened and to please come out here and help her. And then a little while later, when the police showed up, they found Angela still totally hysterical in her condo, her shirt had been ripped in half and she had red spots all around her neck from where this guy had grabbed her, but overall she was okay. The police would search the building, but there was no sign of her attacker. However, Angela would tell police that she was fairly confident she understood what had just happened. She explained what was going on with her and her husband's ex, Michelle, and how despite this restraining order against her, she was clearly signing Angela up for these rape fantasies on Craigslist. And so, most likely, this man who had attacked Angela down in the garage was only there because of this rape fantasy ad. The police took down her statement, and then that night, they would go to Michelle's residence, and they would show her a search warrant that authorized them to search all of her devices, her phone, her laptop, all of them. And when Michelle turned them over and gave up all of her passwords, the police were able to find enough evidence that she was behind the harassment of Angela and Ian that they arrested her on the spot. Angela and Ian were relieved when they heard the news, and that night, while Michelle was in jail, the threatening emails completely stopped. However, the following day, Michelle posted bail, and within hours of her being free again, Jason Ray and Lilith Truth began bombarding Angela's inbox again. Angela was so distraught, she went to the doctor for a checkup, worried that her stress would negatively affect her pregnancy. And to her horror, the doctor would tell her that she had actually lost the twins she had miscarried. And if that wasn't horrible enough, the doctor also discovered that her cervical cancer, which had been in remission, was now back. While Angela and Ian grieved the loss of their unborn children and wondered what they would do about Angela's cancer, the horrible emails continued and men kept showing up at their front door, asking to come inside for violent sex with Angela. Finally, on July 13th, so roughly two weeks since Angela was attacked in the parking garage, Angela looked out of her window and she saw there was this young man kind of lurking on the side of their condo complex and he appeared to be hiding. Worried this guy was going to ambush her as soon as she walked outside, she called the police. The police showed up and they spoke to the young man who would confirm he was there because he was responding to a rape fantasy ad. He said the woman inside, Angela, had told him to come here and have his way with her. After this incident, Ian was completely fed up and he demanded the police do something about this. You need to go arrest Michelle and keep her behind bars. And sure enough, the next day, Michelle was arrested again. But this time, her bail was set for $1 million making it impossible for her to make bond. Angela and Ian finally were able to breathe a sigh of relief, although they didn't know exactly what she would be charged with or what the legal outcomes would be. For the time being, so long as Michelle was in jail, they knew they were safe. Except Michelle was completely innocent. Yes, she did send that first fire and brimstone biblical email the year before in September, the one that led to Ian filing that first restraining order request that was denied. But after that, she had lawyered up and not had any contact with Ian or his new wife. In fact, the first time Michelle had ever even laid eyes on Angela Diaz was on June 17th when Michelle was in court for that second restraining order request against her, which caught her completely by surprise. She had totally moved on with her life at that point and was dating other people and focusing on school. So when she was asked to come in and defend herself in court, 
She barely knew what to say. It didn't make any sense. And then when Michelle was arrested for the second time and couldn't make bail and so had to just sit in jail till her court date, her family hired a lawyer to investigate and figure out who was actually behind the harassment because it wasn't Michelle. And what their lawyer would discover was truly shocking. Every horrible, threatening email that was sent to Angela's inbox was sent by Angela. The rape fantasy ads on Craigslist? Angela. The supposed attempted rape attack on Angela in her parking garage? That was completely made up. It never happened. She made those marks on her neck. She ripped her clothes off. It had all been an elaborate setup by Angela and by Ian. They had been in on this together. At the time they launched this frame job of Michelle, they were only a few weeks away from that six month deadline that Ian had to either sell the condo and split the profits with Michelle or take over the whole mortgage. And apparently Ian and Angela believed their plan would result in Michelle losing her claim to the condo and their legal agreement around the condo would become null and void, thereby saving Ian from being forced to sell the condo or having to potentially pay a higher price for it. The pair were so convinced this plan was going to work that Angela even lied about being pregnant. It was all a ruse to make it seem like Michelle's harassment had led Angela to lose her pregnancy. She was also lying about having cancer. Michelle's lawyer quickly uncovered lots of these holes in Ian and Angela's plan, and finally, after Michelle had sat in prison for 89 days after that second time she was arrested, she was released. On Tuesday, October 17th, 2017, Angela Diaz pleaded guilty to 10 felony and 22 misdemeanor charges, including kidnapping, false imprisonment, and falsely reporting a crime to a peace officer. She was sentenced to five years in state prison. Ian Diaz was not charged with any crimes at the time and continued in his job as a U.S. Marshal. But two years later, on December 20th, 2019, Michelle filed a civil rights lawsuit against Ian, alleging that he was in fact the mastermind of the plot that resulted in her wrongful imprisonment. She also brought charges against the Anaheim Police Department for their failure to properly follow up on evidence they discovered early in the investigation that showed the threatening emails Michelle was accused of sending, in fact, originated from the Diaz household. On Friday, May 3rd, 2021, the Anaheim police announced they had reached an undisclosed cash settlement with Michelle. And then a little over a week later, on May 13th, Ian Diaz was arrested and charged the following day with one count of conspiracy to commit cyberstalking, one count of cyberstalking, and one count of perjury for his false testimony in a deposition in connection with a federal civil lawsuit. If convicted, Ian faces a maximum penalty of five years in prison on each of the counts. His case is still pending. Since her public exoneration back in 2017, Michelle has gone on to finish her MBA, she has left California, and she found a great job in marketing with a beauty company. In 1986, Tom Hawks was a 39-year-old father of two teenage boys. He had previously been married to his boy's mother, but they had ultimately gotten a divorce. That year, Tom and his two sons were at this local chili cook-off in their neighborhood in Newport Beach, California, when Tom was looking out across the sea of people, and he sees this stunningly beautiful woman he's never seen before, and he just finds himself staring at her. And he stares at her so long that this woman, she ends up noticing, and she looks up and kind of smiles and blushes and looks away, and Tom immediately is totally embarrassed because he just got caught staring at her, and so he decides, you know what, I gotta go over there and introduce myself. And so Tom, who's this totally ruggedly handsome, muscular guy with this incredible mustache, he strides across the lawn and he walks up to this woman and he introduces himself and she is all smiles and she says her name is Jackie and she's 29 years old and she's single. And from that point onward, those two completely hit it off. They fell madly in love. And just a few years later in 1989, they got married in front of 150 of their closest friends and family. And then after the wedding, Jackie moved in with Tom and his two boys. And even though the boy's mother was still alive, they began calling Jackie mom because Jackie not only lived with them, but also because she was so devoted to them and she just was such a loving and kind person that it just made sense to do that. Also, Jackie, when she was 22 years old, she had gotten into this horrific motorcycle accident and the internal damage that accident had done to her had left her unable to have kids of her own, something she had always wanted to do. 
And so when she had the opportunity to be these boys' mother, she really leaned into it. And so she was like this fabulous mother. So over the years, Tom and Jackie raised their two sons. And then in 2002, when the boys were all grown up, they left the house. Now, this was a sad moment for Tom and Jackie to suddenly be empty nesters. I mean, so much of their identity was wrapped up in being parents, and they were very close with their sons. But at the same time, they knew this day was coming, and they had actually been preparing for it for several years. They had been putting money aside every single year to prepare for when their sons left because they wanted to time it so they could retire at the same time. And their idea of retirement was to go buy a yacht and just live on the yacht and sail up and down the California and Mexican coastline. Now, neither Jackie nor Tom were wealthy at all. However, they were very good at saving money and they were very disciplined and they could live frugally. And so over the past couple of years, they really had saved virtually every penny so they could afford to buy this yacht. And so finally in 2002, when their sons do actually leave, Tom and Jackie, they sell their house in Newport Beach, California, and between the proceeds from the sale of their house and all this money they had set aside, they had enough to purchase this kind of beat-up old small yacht. And so this yacht they named the Well Deserved. Even though this yacht was by no means a glamorous yacht like you think of when you hear that word, Tom and Jackie adored this boat. And so as soon as it was theirs and they had docked it in Newport, they moved all of their belongings onto this boat because they're going to live on this boat. And then they began meticulously cleaning it and organizing it and upgrading it everywhere they could within their limited budget. And by the summer of that year, this boat was beautiful, both on the outside and the inside, it was very cozy and very clearly had the touch of Tom and Jackie. It was a home. And so for the next two years, Tom and Jackie, they lived the dream. They took that yacht and just sailed up and down the coast of California and Mexico. And they would watch these beautiful sunsets and they would catch fresh fish and they would drink cocktails together. I mean, they were really enjoying their retirement. Then, in 2004, they got some unexpected news. One of their sons told them that he was now expecting to be a father. And so this baby was going to be the first grandchild of Tom and Jackie, and they were so excited. Especially Jackie, because remember, she wasn't able to have kids of her own, and she just loved the idea of getting to be motherly again, and the idea of getting to hold this precious little baby. And so even though Tom and Jackie were absolutely loving living out on this yacht, they decided that the time was right to actually sell the yacht and then take the proceeds from the sale of the yacht and buy a house on land to be closer to their son and this grandbaby. So in November of that year, the Hawks place an ad in this fishing magazine for the sale of their yacht. They were asking for about half a million dollars. And very quickly after this ad went live, this young couple who had saved up some cash, they offered to buy it. Tom and Jackie were totally thrilled and they called their two sons to tell them the good news that they had this buyer and that in the next couple of days, the sale would be finalized and then they would be in touch. And so the sons, they're expecting to get a phone call from Tom and Jackie any day but a couple of days goes by and they haven't heard from them. And so the sons begin calling their parents and their parents aren't picking up their phone. Now, Tom and Jackie were not the type to go any amount of time without being in touch with their family. And so this was very uncharacteristic. And so when Tom's brother, Jim, who was a retired police chief, when he heard about this sudden silence, he just got in his car and drove to Newport Beach, California to see if maybe they had not finalized the sale of the yacht and maybe the couple was still on the yacht and he could go check in with them and make sure everything was okay. And so Jim, along with a friend of his, they arrive in Newport Beach, they make their way to the dock where the yacht was being held, and they go down to the floating section of the stock, and they walk right up alongside the well-deserved, and just from where they're standing, it does not seem like anyone is on the yacht. However, as they're standing there just kind of looking at this yacht right in front of them, Jim notices a couple of oddities. He sees there are lines hanging over the side of the boat that should have been stowed. And Tom was known for being incredibly meticulous and orderly. I mean, that yacht was spick and span always. And so he would not have left these lines draped over the edge of the boat unless he was on board, and he wasn't. And so Jim's also looking around, and he sees there are a couple of tarps that go over some of the control panels that had been taken off, but then not put back on the control panels. And so again, that's not something Tom or Jackie would have done. 
And then there's also some dirty towels kind of hanging out of one of the portholes. And so overall, the impression Jim and this friend got was, I guess they must have finalized the sale of this yacht because clearly the new owners of this boat, they're the ones that are in possession of it. And they're the reason it's sloppy because Tom and Jackie, they never would leave the boat in this condition. And so Jim pulls out his own business card and he writes a note on it that he's looking to speak with the new owners of this boat because his brother and his brother's wife had sold this boat to them, but now they're missing. And so please give me a call back. And so Jim and his friend, they leave the boat, they leave the dock, and they begin to leave the area when Jim's cell phone rings and he picks it up and it's this 21 year old woman named Jennifer de Leon. And so she tells Jim that she got his business card on her yacht and that yes, she and her husband had recently purchased this yacht from the Hawks. But like Jim, they were having a hard time getting in touch with the Hawks as well. Because after acquiring their boat, Jennifer said she and her husband realized there were a couple of controls on the boat that they didn't know how to use. And so they needed to talk to Tom and Jackie to explain how to use them. Also, Jennifer said she had found some personal belongings that belonged to Tom and Jackie that were stuffed in a couple of drawers that just got left behind. And so she wanted to return that property to them as well. But she's telling Jim, I'm trying to get in touch with them and I can't get in touch with them. And so Jim asked Jennifer, you know, when was the last time you or your husband saw Tom or Jackie? And she would say, you know, the last time we saw them was when we actually finalized the sale of the boat, when we literally gave them the money and we watched them take the money, hop in their car and drive away. Jim asked her if she had any idea where they might have been going. And Jennifer said, you know, we really didn't have that many personal conversations with Tom or Jackie. It was mostly just business stuff. But in the limited personal interactions we did have, Tom would always talk about how he and Jackie planned on buying a house in Mexico in this town that bordered Arizona because apparently they have a son that lives in Arizona and he's about to have a baby and they were talking about how they wanted to be very close. Jim thanked Jennifer and asked her, you know, if you hear from Tom or Jackie, please let me know. And then Jennifer says to Jim, you know, same thing to you. If you hear from them, please let me know because I need to talk to them too. And so they hang up and Jim is left thinking, you know, what's going on here? And then Jim remembers there's this woman that Tom and Jackie had hired. Her name was Patricia. And for the past couple of years that they had been out on their boat, they knew they would not have great internet. And so they would not be able to consistently be able to pay their bills and pay taxes. And so they had hired this woman, Patricia, who was also a friend of theirs, to basically pay their bills and manage their finances. And so Jim gets her number and he calls Patricia. And the first thing he asks her is, you know, hey, have you spoken with Tom or Jackie recently? And she says, you know, no, I haven't. And so Jim explains the situation and then asks Patricia, has Tom or Jackie recently made a large deposit into any of their accounts? Because just a couple of days ago, they would have received nearly $500,000. And so Patricia, she checks the accounts and she says, no, there's been no deposits made. And so Jim and Patricia are talking on the phone, trying to rationalize why Tom and Jackie would not have deposited so much money. And they really couldn't come up with a reasonable explanation for it. And so after Jim hung up with Patricia, he just had a bad feeling about what was going on. And so Jim called the Newport Beach Police Department and he officially reported Tom and Jackie missing. The first thing the Newport Beach Police Department did with this missing person report was to do some digging on the new buyers of this yacht, the De Leones. And when they looked at the 25-year-old husband named Skyler, they discovered he was a felon. He had been arrested and convicted of armed robbery and had spent some time in jail for it. And so naturally, the police were immediately suspicious of Skylar de Leon and really the de Leons in general because they were the last ones to see the Hawks before they went missing. And so they sent one of their detectives down to the dock to just kind of walk around, go walk around the yacht and just kind of feel it out, see what's going on down there, see if there's anything unusual. And so this detective goes down to the dock, they walk onto the floating section of the dock and they walk right up alongside the well-deserved. And from the looks of it, it doesn't appear that anybody's on board and as this detective is kind of looking in the window and just kind of looking around, they think they see what looks like a bloody handprint inside the boat. And so that would end up being enough to get a search warrant. And before long that day, there were police swarming this boat, looking all over it. But it would turn out that was not a bloody handprint. It was actually just some rust. And there was nothing else of significance that was found on board this boat. And so the police are pretty frustrated because they really don't have any leads. And so they contact Skylar de Leon and they say, hey, you need to come into the police station and explain exactly what happened during your final interaction with the Hawks. And so Skylar comes to the police station. He's totally cooperative. 
And he explains to the detectives that, you know, he saw this ad in this fishing magazine for a yacht. He contacted Tom Hawk and said, I'm interested. The two of them met up and then went out for a sea trial, which is basically a test drive, but for a boat. And during the sea trial, Skylar told Tom that he liked the boat and he wanted to go forward with the purchase. And so on November 15th, Skylar, along with his pregnant wife and his young daughter and also a notary and another person, a friend of Skylar's that was there just kind of as a witness, they go to the parking lot of the dock right near where the yacht is. And then the Hawks show up, Tom and Jackie, and the De Leons literally hand over a suitcase full of cash to Tom. And then Tom and Jackie, with the notary, they sign the sale documentation, basically giving the boat over to the De Leons. And then Tom and Jackie took their suitcase full of cash, hopped in their SUV, and they drove off, presumably to go to Mexico. When the police asked Skylar, how were you able to afford such an expensive vessel? Skylar would tell them that back in the 1990s, he was actually a child star, or kind of. He was an extra on the very popular TV show, Power Rangers, and from being on that show, he had made a bunch of money and he had set it aside. And as Skylar is telling the detectives this, he kind of just stops himself at some point and he's like, you know what? That's not really the truth. The reality is the reason we had the money to do this is not because of the cash I got from being a child star. It's actually because I stole the money. It would turn out that armed robbery that Skylar was convicted for and spent some time in jail for, that was because he was stealing money from this drug kingpin. And before he was arrested and sent off to jail, he had managed to take the money that he had stolen and hide it. And then after he had gone to jail and got out again, he came back to his hiding space and he just retrieved the money. But this money was stolen drug money, so it was hot. And so he needed to get rid of it. He needed to launder the money. And so that was why he was buying this yacht. He was going to buy it with this dirty money in bulk in cash and basically transform this hot, dirty money into this yacht. And then he was going to sell the yacht and get clean money for it. And so the police are totally shocked at this confession because Skylar has just completely incriminated himself in a money laundering scheme. But the police would ultimately say to Skylar, you know what, we're not going to charge you with money laundering because you're being so forthright and helpful with this investigation. And so they let Skylar go. The police would go on to interview Skylar's wife, Jennifer, as well as the notary and also that other friend who had come along for that final sale of the boat who was there as a witness. And so the police interview all three of those people and they ask them, you know, what was your final interaction with Tom and Jackie like? And they all described the same situation of seeing Tom and Jackie taking the suitcase full of cash and then signing the paperwork, hopping in their car and driving off. The only detail that seemed to differ amongst these four people who were there was the way Tom and Jackie were acting. Skylar made it seem like Tom was kind of anxious and paranoid about having all this money. Whereas the notary said, you know, Tom and Jackie seemed completely normal to me. After all the interviews with these people who had seen Tom and Jackie last, the police felt like they had kind of reached a dead end and just didn't know what to do next. And so they went to the media and asked them to put out a bulletin that had a picture of Tom and Jackie, as well as a picture of their vehicle. And it asked people to come forward if they had seen them. And sure enough, within a couple of days of this bulletin going out on TV, this older couple in Mexico called the police to say the Hawks SUV is right across the street from me right now. It's parked right on the road. And so naturally, the Mexican authorities, as well as American authorities, they rush to this location and they charge up to the house where this SUV is parked. And they're kind of expecting to find Jackie and Tom inside or someone that at least knows Tom and Jackie. But when they knock on the door, this guy, nobody recognized, someone who was living in Mexico, he comes up to the door and he's looking very confused. And the police ask him, you know, whose SUV is that parked outside? And he said, oh, well, that's my friend's car. And they say, well, is your friend Tom or Jackie Hawks? And the guy's like, no, who's that? The car belongs to Skylar de Leon. This was, of course, the moment when the police realized Skylar was lying to them. He had told police the last time he had seen Jackie and Tom, they had hopped in their SUV and they had driven off. But clearly that was not the last time because he somehow managed to acquire their car afterwards and then he gave it to this random person in Mexico. So the police in Newport Beach, they used Skyler's money laundering confession on camera to bring him in. They arrested him on money laundering and then with him in custody, they searched his home. 
And inside of his and Jennifer's house, they found all these things that belonged to the Hawks. Things like laptops and video cameras, things Tom and Jackie would not have left behind on the boat. But despite all this evidence connecting Skylar de Leon to the Hawks' disappearance, he maintained his innocence and said this was just a big misunderstanding. And then while he was in custody getting grilled by police, his wife, Jennifer, was also saying the same thing, that Skylar didn't do anything. She was even going on talk shows and talking about how this is just one big misunderstanding and Skylar had nothing to do with the Hawks' disappearance. That they are just as concerned about Tom and Jackie as everybody else is. But the police were not buying it. They knew Skylar knew something that he wasn't telling them, obviously. However, they weren't really getting anywhere interviewing Skylar. He was just kind of saying, look, I had nothing to do with it. And so the police decide, let's go back and re-interview the notary and also that other friend who was there as a witness on that day that the final sale of the boat took place. And so they call the notary back into the police department. And the notary is this woman named Kathleen Harris, who's never gotten in trouble in her life. And she's been a very successful notary for a long time. And so she sits down and they ask her again to describe her final interactions with Tom and Jackie. And once again, she says, yep, they came over, they signed the paperwork, they took their cash, they got in their SUV and they drove off. But under follow on very intensive questioning by the police, Kathleen would finally break. And she would say, actually, I've never met Tom and Jackie in my entire life. I was paid up front in cash by Skylar de Leon to backdate those sale documents that had already been signed. I have no idea what happened to Tom and Jackie. Next, the police went out and got that friend who was also there at the time of the final sale, that witness. His name was Alonzo Mation. And so they bring him in and they ask him, you know, what was your final interaction like with Tom and Jackie? And at first he stuck to the story that, you know, they got the cash, they hopped in the SUV, they drove off, da 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 that's all it was. And the police stop him and they're like, uh-uh, we just spoke to the notary and she said she was lying. She wasn't even there. She had backdated those documents. So we know you're lying. And so as soon as Alonzo got caught red-handed, he began to clam up. It was pretty obvious he did not want to say anything else. And since the police really needed something to happen with this case, they said to Alonzo, we will make sure your sentence is heavily reduced if you tell us everything you know about what happened to Tom and Jackie. And so Alonzo says, okay, I'll tell you. Alonzo was a young guy, very impressionable. He was in his early to mid-20s. And he was actually a jailer and he had met Skylar when Skylar was in jail. He was in jail for that armed robbery. And so after Skylar gets out of jail, Alonzo and Skylar somehow stay friends. and They spend a lot of time together. And then in November of 2004, Skylar pulls Alonzo aside and he confesses to him that he is in fact an international assassin, that people paid him to kill people. But only bad people, Skylar said. And he says to Alonzo, I have a current contract on two really bad people, Tom and Jackie Hawks, but I need help carrying this out. And so if you will help me carry out this contract, I will give you 1 million US dollars. And so Alonzo's like, man, okay, yeah, I'll help you. And so on November 15th, Skylar, Alonzo, and a third man that Skylar had recruited to be a part of this job, he was this big, muscular, intimidating looking guy who was actually a longtime Southern California gang member. His name was John Kennedy. Those three, they show up at the parking lot of the dock not to finalize the sale of this yacht. They weren't even close to finalizing the sale. They were there to meet up with Tom and Jackie to do a sea trial, a test drive. But when Tom and Jackie arrive, Tom, who was a longtime probation officer and so was very used to being around felons and convicts, he immediately sized these three up and thought, bad news. And so when the two parties met each other in the parking lot, Skylar started to notice that Tom was definitely apprehensive about getting on a boat with them. In fact, Tom was talking about potentially rescheduling and that, you know, today's not a good day. And Skylar's seeing, you know, okay, they're clearly uneasy about getting on the boat with us. And so Skylar says, hey, Tom, Jackie, hold on a minute. I'm going to step aside and make a phone call. 
And so Skylar steps aside and he calls his wife, Jennifer, and she was not far away. And so just a couple of minutes later, Jennifer pulls into the parking lot carrying her little one-year-old baby girl. And as soon as she walks over to this group, the dynamic completely changes. Jackie sees this baby and she immediately falls in love with it and she wants to hold the baby and she loves Jennifer. Jennifer is so sweet. And so Jackie seems very much at ease and Tom notices that. And so Tom begins to loosen up and before long, Tom is saying to Skylar, you know what guys, today's fine, let's do the sea trial. And so the group eventually begins to make their way onto the yacht, the well-deserved, to do the sea trial. And right as they're about to get on, Jennifer says, hey guys, I can't go on the sea trial. The baby's upset, I gotta go home. I'll see you guys when you get back. And at this point, Tom and Jackie, they've already committed to doing the sea trial. And so even if they were a little bit apprehensive going on this boat with just these three guys, they put their faith in the daily owns that this was on the up and up. So the two hawks, along with these three men, they get on board the boat and they begin heading out towards open water. And so Tom was piloting the boat. And at some point when they were very far away from the dock and really any land in any direction, Skylar and John come up to Tom and they say, hey, we want to show you something down in the lower levels of the ship. And so Tom goes with them. They go downstairs into the bedroom. And while they're down there, Alonzo and Jackie were in the kitchen, which is right above the bedroom. And as they're standing there, Alonzo and Jackie suddenly hear this very loud commotion coming from the bedroom. Now, Alonzo knew what that was. It was Skylar and John attacking Tom. And so that was his cue. Alonzo leapt forward and he grabbed onto Jackie. And before Jackie could even figure out what was going on, he had thrown her to the ground, pulled her hands behind her back, and then he pulled out handcuffs that he had and he handcuffed her hands together. And as soon as Jackie was subdued in the kitchen, Skylar and John, they come up the stairs and Tom's not with them. And they grab Jackie and they walk her down into the bedroom. And Jackie would have seen her husband, Tom. He's been handcuffed and he's laying on the bed on his back. And so they throw Jackie onto the bed right next to Tom. And immediately Jackie turns around and looks at Skylar and says, why are you doing this to us? We just met your wife. I just held your baby. Why are you doing this? All we want to do is just go back to land and be with our children and be with our grandchildren, please. But Skylar didn't care. He just turned to Alonzo and said, put tape on both of their mouths and their eyes. And as Alonzo was doing that, Skylar went upstairs and began piloting the boat towards the deepest part of the ocean. And so as Skylar is driving this boat, Alonzo and John are down in the bedroom and Alonzo remembers looking over at Tom and Tom was comforting Jackie. He had managed to pull his hand up and he was stroking Jackie's hand and he was saying to her, it's gonna be okay, no matter what happens to us, we'll be together. Suddenly the boat stopped because Skylar had reached the deepest part of the ocean and he called down to John and Alonzo to bring Jackie and Tom up onto the deck. And so Alonzo and John do just that. They march Tom and Jackie up the steps. They bring them out to the deck of the ship. And then Skylar forces them to sign the sail documentation for the boat, as well as have them sign additional paperwork that gave Skylar access to their bank accounts. And while they were signing these documents, Jackie actually misspelled her last name on one of the signature blocks. She left the S off of her last name. That's not something she would have done by accident. It's pretty clear she did that on purpose to signal to the future that she signed this under duress. After all these documents were signed, the three men led their two captives to the back of the boat. And then once they were standing at the back of the boat, Skylar tells Alonzo in earshot of Jackie and Tom to, hey, go to the front of the boat and get the anchor. And so Tom and Jackie, they know that whatever's going to happen to them next, it's not good. And so Jackie begins pleading with them to let them live, let them go back to land, let them see their grandchild. And Tom manages to shake his restraints from John, who was holding him, and he manages to kick Skylar really hard in the groin. But after that, John leapt on top of Tom and Jackie and subdued both of them. And then he positioned Tom and Jackie so they were sitting down back to back with their handcuffs connected to each other. And then Alonzo shows up dragging this heavy anchor and he finally gets it all the way over until it's right next to Tom and Jackie. At which point, Skylar grabs the long metal chain that came off of the anchor and he felt around until he got to the very end of the chain. So not the side closest to the anchor that's attached to it, the far other side, the bitter end of this chain. And he reached down and he connected that portion of the chain to Tom and Jackie's handcuffs. And then once he was sure their handcuffs were securely fastened to the end of this chain, Skylar stood up, walked over and grabbed the anchor. And with quite a bit of effort, he managed to lift it up and threw it over the side of the boat. 
As soon as that anchor hit the water, all Tom and Jackie would have heard for several seconds would be the sound of all of that loose chain that they were connected to being rapidly pulled off the boat and being sucked down into the water. And so that chain was going up and over this wooden railing, and so all they would have heard is just chain links grinding over the railing until finally the anchor pulled the chain tight, at which point it yanked Tom and Jackie towards the side of the boat. Alonzo would say when this happened, Jackie's head struck the inside of the side of the boat so hard it made this very loud, audible cracking sound. And then Skylar, Alonzo, and John just stood there as Tom and Jackie desperately tried to fight against the weight of this anchor that was trying to pull them off of the boat. Tom was trying to hold on to anything he could to try to hold his wife in place, but eventually the weight of this anchor combined with the movement of the boat was just too much. And so Tom and Jackie were very slowly pulled up and over and off the boat into the water. When they hit the water, they would have been fully alive, fully conscious as they began their rapid descent to the bottom of the ocean, 3,500 feet below. Alonzo would tell police as soon as Tom and Jackie disappeared below the surface, Skylar let out a woohoo and ran over to the edge of the boat and looked into the water like a giddy child. And he was staring at where they had disappeared and he was just grinning and laughing. And then finally, when the water went calm and there were no more bubbles, Skylar just kind of laughed, turned around and made his way back to the cockpit and began piloting the boat back towards the dock. Even though Jennifer was not on the boat at the time of the murder, she was equally involved in it. In fact, the attack was her idea. She wanted more money, and she saw this scheme as being a way of doing that. So remember, when she showed up at the dock parking lot with her baby and put Jackie and Tom at ease to help get them out on that sea trial, she was doing that very intentionally to trap Jackie and Tom. She knew what was going to happen out on that boat. She was trying to get them to go so they could be murdered and they could steal their boat. And when Skylar was out on the boat, before, during, and after the murders, he would step aside and call Jennifer to let her know how it was going and kind of get her feedback and ask for advice about what they should do next. With that in mind, one of the darker elements of this case has to do with the video camera that was discovered inside of Jennifer and Skylar's house. It was the Hawks video camera, and they had used it over the past couple of years to document their travels out on the ocean. And so when the police acquired this video camera, they played the tape that was inside of it. And at first, the tape shows Jackie filming the inside of the well-deserved yacht. And she's talking about how sad it was that this is probably one of the last times they'll be inside of this boat. But she and Tom are so happy because they've found buyers who are going to take great care of this boat. And they're excited about the future. They're excited about their grandchild. And then suddenly, this footage of Jackie inside of the boat just totally cuts and it jumps to Skylar and Jennifer at Thanksgiving dinner that year, playing with their daughter and just having this great time. Meaning, just days after Jennifer and Skylar murdered Tom and Jackie in the worst way imaginable, they took their camera and just began using it for their own lives, recording their own life over the memories of Tom and Jackie. Jennifer and Skylar truly didn't care at all all about what they had just done. Alonzo would ultimately be sentenced to 20 years in prison. He would have gotten a much more severe sentence, but because he provided all of the details of what happened and he was promised a reduction in sentence, he was only given 20 years. Jennifer would be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and John Kennedy and Skylar were sentenced to
Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bowen podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please take the five star review button hostage and then force them to wash your dishes while wearing a long sleeve shirt. However, don't allow them to roll their sleeves up. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, and everywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday, but in the meantime, there are hundreds of stories available right now on my YouTube channel just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please send me a direct message on any major social media platform. My username on all of them is just at Mr. Ballin, and yes, I really do read the bulk of my direct messages. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. Okay, that's gonna do it. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, see ya.